Welcome to Darth Hawk Gaming. So, Rules of Engagement 2. What's the story behind this in the, in the game world? Yeah, you can adjust 18 personality traits for captains, and I believe also enemy races. In terms of how they act in the game. Made by <clears throat> Omnitrend. So let's go to the, uh, well, let's see. Designer's notes. 1993 marks Omnitrend's 10th anniversary. With a new decade ahead, we are recommitting ourselves to producing innovative and exciting new games. To civilize this continued commitment, we have changed our company logo. This new bold modern look will bring Omnitrend through the next decade. We hope you will be there with us. Omnitrend's still around, by the way. Um, and uh, I don't think they're making games anymore, but they do own the uh, copyright for Rules of Engagement 2. Obviously, still they're still around. Uh, I believe now they're working with, they're making, um, I believe they've been working on uh, programming for <clears throat> network applications, things like that. So, uh, to kick off the, all right, uh, this game represents a significant advance in computer game AI. Yes, it does. We have done much research and experimentation to develop this, not this technology. The results speak for themselves. Uh, I can go to uh, Space Game Junkie. I uh, did an interview with the uh, developers of this game. It's posted on his website back in 2013. Um, where well, they talk about actually the AI and how they, they did it. And the research they did for the game. Um, this <clears throat> game came out in 1993. In Rules of Engagement 2, we'll be dealing with other characters that have more detail and realism than any computer opponents to date. In addition to the use of our now Hallmark Builder program, you can create and edit personalities of your own. I hope that during the course of uh, your playing this game, you will take the time to experiment with these personality traits. We think you'll be amazed at how fun and interesting it can be to see how different personalities react in various scenarios. Rules of Engagement 2 has features that also features the world's first three structured campaign builder. All the campaigns you will play in the game are, oh, tree structured, three stru <laughs> tree structured, are tree structured. This means that at the conclusion of each mission you play, the next mission will be selected based on a win or a loss. As such, the campaign story will progress different, differently depending on your actions. Rules of Engagement 2 features the world's first tree structure campaign builder. Using this tool, you can edit campaigns that come with the game or create your own. We've even given you the ability to add your own graphics and animation to your campaign. Rules of Engagement 2 continues the story started in our very first game, Universe, further on in uh, the span, you can read this background story, and if you played any of our previous games, engage in a bit of nostalgia. We plan to continue the story with many of our future games. Lastly, I would like to thank all of our players who have contributed ideas and suggestions over the past 10 years. It has been great fun hearing from you, and we hope that we have satisfied many of your wishes. We look forward to hearing from you through the next decade. Thomas Arcabone, President, Omnitrend Software Incorporated. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so the story so far, approximately 23,000 light years away from the core of the barred spiral ga galaxy known as the Milky Way, one of the spiral arms exists a class G2 main sequence star designated Sol. One of the nine planets orbiting this rather unremarkable star is a habitable to oxygen process and carbon-based life forms, globe named Earth. To date, Earth has produced only one sapient uh, space-faring race called humans. Humans were restricted to the confines of the Earth for the first four million years of their existence. 
All that changed in the middle of the 20th century when the race took its first tentative steps into the void of space. Our story begins in earnest with the first stellar expansion, which began on May 10th, 2029. With the first practical demonstration of the hyperdrive field effect, the test was carried out in Building 4 of Area 117 of the Franklin Class Labs Research Range at Hawthorne, Nevada, in what was then the United States of America. Uh, the region is now part of the Federal Republic of the Americas. Five years later, that country's National Aeronautics and Space Administration deployed the unmanned vehicle, vehicles Odysseus 1 and 2 to test the practicality of hyperdrive as a method of interplanetary inter interstellar travel. Odysseus 1 successfully engaged hyperdrive, but its field effect was greater than anticipated and resulted in the destruction of both the probe and the space tug which had launched it. Odysseus 2 was launched two months later, and its hyperdrive activated only when it had left the vicinity of Earth and Luna. Odysseus 2 returned to Earth orbit three weeks later, having successfully hyperjumped to the Oort cloud at the perimeter of the solar system, taking readings and photos, and then returned. In 2040, only 11 years after the hyperdrive field was first tested, and seven years after the Odysseus probes, the first practical starship, the USS C. Gerardus Mercator, with its crew of seven, made a successful jump of over two light years through hyperspace less than 100 years after that. First man jumped the colonies of Earth consisted of eight planets and over 18 billion inhabitants, scattered across several solar systems in the neighborhood of Sol Earth and were known as the Home Cluster. Hyperspace proved to be rather curious. It was totally devoid of energy or matter, yet spacecraft could operate normally within its bounds. A trip through it, a hyperjump, would take regardless of the actual distance in normal space 6.8433 Earth days. There were, however, two limitations to its use. So, wait. So, <clears throat> a trip through it, a hyperjump, would take regardless of the actual distance in normal space 6.8433 Earth days. So, does that mean you could, in this, um, the lore of this uh, game world, you hyper jump like either a few hundred thousand kil kilometers or ten light years, and both trips take almost seven days. Hmm. There were, however, two limitations to its use. One was the enormous amount of energy required to enter hyperspace. The other was the so-called mass limit, which stated simply uh, placed a severe limit on the size of the spacecraft that could enter hyperspace. By the late 2000s, starships powered by mass conversion were strained severely just to travel from one end of the home cluster to the opposite end, and three ships were lost when the strain overloaded their systems. The energy fuel requirements for jumps beyond the home cluster, oh, demand starships larger than the mass limit permitted. Because of this fact, and that all of the home cluster colonies remained dependent on Earth for support, the experts were predicting an end to the expansion. Okay, so, as usual, the experts were wrong. <clears throat> oh, so this is interesting information right here. Um, the 2029 CE is actually 2028 because it includes the year zero as one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in 2095, a team of scientists traveling through the far reaches of the Tosseti solar system were shocked when they discovered a huge alien artifact drifting through space. Uh, entire scientific communities came to study the artifact, and several years later, the purpose of the great object was discovered. It was a hyperspace booster device with the capability to push spacecraft and other objects, not tens, but thousands of light years, through hyperspace. Since the booster itself did not enter hyperspace, it was calculated to exceed the mass limit by a factor of thousands. A ship right up to the mass limit could travel enormous distances using virtually no power. Years of research continued. Why had the Charon, the gatekeepers, as the scientists dubbed them, abandoned a working booster? Where had they gone? The scientists were unable to say. Eventually, elements of the Charon Charon's control system were deciphered, and trial boosts began. They proved the booster to be fully functional, and the technician's knowledge of the control system was deemed adequate to allow regular use. The second stellar expansion was underway. 
The booster contained a mapping system of millions of stars, only a few of which seemed to have any special destination. In 2100, researchers christened the most notable of these stars HOPE. Their studies of the mapping system led them to believe that HOPE and its surrounding systems were populated, perhaps by the builders of the booster. This encouraged potential explorers who sought to use the booster to travel to the HOPE star system and meet the constructors of the hyperspace booster. These first explorers boarded, boarded their spacecraft and were hurled to the local group by the booster in late 2109. When the explorers failed to return to Earth along with some aliens, the booster researchers went back to the databanks, and the next conclusion uh, they reached was that the symbols associated with hope and the stars around it meant that the area, which by this time had been dubbed the local group, was usually well populated with habitable planets. Fortunately for our forefathers, the assumption was correct. By 2208, the last, uncolon the last uncolonized habitable planet within the local group boundaries was formally settled, Arbest. Colonists continued to arrive en masse from the home cluster until 2299, when colonization efforts were shifted to the more uh, recently discovered dark cluster. Smaller groups of colonies continued to arrive until the end of colon colonists continued to arrive until the end of 2322. From the very beginning, the local group had received development assistance of packages from the home cluster to assist them in constructing new colonies and providing updates to the technology. In 2323, the shipments stopped coming. Officially, the word was there hadn't been any indication that they would stop. The 10 years that followed were known as the Great Panic, a period of interstellar war and piracy that nearly destroyed human civilization in the local group. For Fortunately, at the peak of hostilities, a hyperspace booster was discovered inside the local group. The knowledge that two-way communication with home cluster might be established acted to calm the local group. A monumental plan was put into action to move the booster entirely at sublight speeds into orbit around Cetus Amicus. But during the d decades uh, the move required, the local group again fell into turmoil, this time to emerge divided into two mutually hostile governments, the Federated Worlds, uh, and the United Democratic Planets. Following years of instability and chaos, the Federated World, the FW and UDP uh, ceased, hostil ceased hostilities and formed an overarching government agency known as the Local Group Unification Organization, which was to oversee the slow unification of the two nations. Several years after the unification process began, the hyperspace booster at Cetus Amicus was certified as operational. The Federated Worlds, eager to reestablish contact with the home cluster, dispatched the FWS Union under the command of Captain Al Alex G. Seward to use the booster and travel to the Tosseti. Travel to Tosseti 3, the location of the home cluster's hyperspace booster. Captain Seward completed his mission overcoming a saboteur and exophomic locals and uncovering the truth about the discontinuance of development assistance packages to the local group. Seward's report of his findings sent back to the local group uh, with uh, via the Tosseti booster led to an investigation by the Federal World Special Forces Intelligence Division. Uh, it was discovered that a conspiracy had been going on for those 50 years of non-contact involving high-level officials in not only the home cluster, but also in both FW and UDP, many of whom were currently serving on the local group unification organization's high council. Some of the investigation's findings were leaked, and thus caused the unification organization to collapse with both UDP and FW governments implicated in the conspiracy. Both sides grew mistrustful and hostile following several military incidents on 20. Following several military incidents on 24th April 2374 CE, which would actually be uh, 2373 AD, uh, <clears throat> based on the information given here, <clears throat> the UDP declared war on the Federated Worlds. After two years of conflict in which neither side could gain the upper hand, uh, the UDP assumed a less outwardly aggressive posture, targeting, uh, targeting the strikes at key weaknesses in the Federal World's Armed Forces. And here's a map of the local group. Okay. Hope is right here in the middle. Um, and our praxis right here is a UDP um, 
system. Uh, and then, I think Altair Valtari, um, some, yes, there's a, where's the itchar system? Oh, right here. I believe that's important in the game. I believe this is the Federated Worlds system. It's a hope it's our favorite worlds. Uh, anyway, so. So, yeah, it's sort of spread out. <laughs> uh, all right. During the period uh, just prior to and during the FWDP war, a number of sapien species were encountered by both governments. A few were peaceful, others were not. In many cases, the humans and local group had no clue as to the origin of these aliens. This is the situation which exists today. So this is a region of space that the game's taking place in. And let's say I believe is an HR where the booster is, maybe. Uh Yeah, Cetus Amicus, I believe, is in the ACAR system. All right. So, yeah, that's the story so far. Um, that's what's going on in this game's universe. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it seems that they can have contact with Earth, uh, the home cluster, but they choose not to. <laughs> Apparently, relations have been severed, because you don't really, in the game, uh, we don't have any any contact with Earth, any talking about Earth. It's like, yeah, uh, whatever happened with that, uh, they lost contact, they got contact, there was a conspiracy they found out. It was bad enough <clears throat> to apparently sever all contacts with Earth and the, the home group. All right. So, thanks for watching this video. Learn to play games and have fun.